Hello, everybody, and Merry Christmas. I'm your host of Faith Unaltered, David Russell, and I am here with my co-host today, Tyler Fowler, and my good friend and host at times, co-host at times, yeah, we we do that, uh, Dale Glover. We are here to talk about the zeitgeist. We have some fun. We're going to have some fun with it. Uh, the reason we're doing it, again, we do see that many people are still asking questions about this crazy movie that came out in 2007. So we're going to tackle some of the issues that, that it brings forth today, and we hope you guys have a good time. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, David Russell, and this is another Faith Unaltered. And again, Merry Christmas to all you guys out there. Um, I'm your host, David Russell, and I'm here with Tyler Fowler and Dale. So, guys, how has your week been, and what's been going on? What's up? Hey, what's Go up? ahead, Dale. Uh, yeah, just basically grading for me, uh, grading final exams and stuff like that. Um Nothing exciting to, to really mention. Looking forward to Christmas, but yeah. How about you guys? So I'm the same, are... man. Yeah. Go, go ahead, ahead David. Tyler. No, go ahead, Tyler. No, I was just going to say that I don't know if y'all can hear me or not very well. Uh, I hope so, but basically we're down on internet and I'm running from my phone. And so if y'all, uh, that's why I'm not on camera. But if you, uh, yeah, I'm excited. We're going to do a Zeitgeist episode tonight. We're going to debunk it, as many people have uh, in the past. But as David said a while ago, uh, there are still people talking about Zeitgeist, and it's still getting some kind of fame uh, in more ways than one, I guess you could say. But we're here to debunk it. We're going to play a couple of video clips. We're going to go through the arguments and examine them and really show you guys and gals the truth of the claims that are made in this horrible, horrible movie. So, David? Right on, dude. I agree. I mean, it is pretty horrible. And one of the reasons was is that, you know, I've had several people come up to, to me at my work and ask me about this movie. And so I decided, you know what? This thing is still running. And so I, I looked it up, and sure enough, there's still people commenting on it today about how much it's changed their life. So I do want to deal with some of these claims. Let's 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 pretty much get into it. Dale, I, I think you've got the first uh, thing to start playing, right? Oh, okay, sure. Um, so, so yeah, I guess for my introduction, I'm not going to waste a lot of time talking. I, I prepared like a very short, uh, less than 10-minute video clip. Um, now, one thing I just want to say up, up front before I play that, though, is because um, I know, David, the inspiration for this show is that you have some work colleagues that actually believe in 
the truth of the zeitgeist movie. So yeah, we're, you know, today's show is going to be fun. It's going to be polemical and stuff like that. But I do want to bear in mind, uh, look, my, you know, my video is kind of polemical and stuff like that. Um, but I do respect that, you know, some people actually believe this. So I don't want to be overly offensive towards them. Uh, just try to look past the polemics and look to the substance of our points kind of thing. But um, yeah, with that said, uh, let the games begin. All right. Would it be it. bad if I said that I want to be overly offensive to the people that still believe this because the director of Zeitgeist was overly offensive to me? Is that bad? Is that <laughs> it's, trading it's, evil for evil? It's not bad at all. No, because the, the Zeitgeist movie is ridiculous and it, it's insane. <laughs> Some people, some people haven't studied it, so like I, I don't want to turn yeah. those guys off if we're trying to to witness to them. But, anyways, uh, let's Fair get enough. into polemics. So, all right. Uh, so here's a little video that I made. Um, Look out, you funny lay atheists and skeptics! I know you really like the Zeitgeist movie, and you think that it's chock full of uh, educational content and historically accurate information that just disproves Christianity and shows that Jesus is uh, really just another pagan myth and all the myths are all the same as the story of Jesus in terms of his life and ministry. Well, all I can say is buckle up, skeptics. You're in for a bumpy ride. Moving on. Um, does it ever bother you that the story of a man mm -hmm. who was born of a virgin, was resurrected, your bio mm -hmm. was something that was going around the Mediterranean for at least a thousand years? We've got Krishna, who was in India a thousand years before Christ. Krishna was a carpenter, born of a virgin, baptized in a river. Are you saying that was written in history? That was written down in well, history? Which is absolutely. Like, There's yeah. the, the Persian god Mithra 600 years before Christ, born December 25th, before miracles, resurrected on the third day, known as the Lamb, the Way, the Truth, the Light, the yeah. Savior, Messiah. Stop! Yes, Lima. I thank you uh, very much for coming today. My name is Shane. I'm a history major here at UCF. Uh -huh. And um, my question has to do with uh, the religious history, uh, the uh, religious history in the Mediterranean. And it appears as though uh, the Jesus' bio, as it was, was going around the Mediterranean for a thousand years before him, as well as, I mean, and, uh, for example, Osiris' son Horus has pretty much the exact same bio. And I was wondering how you... Uh, reconcile your faith and uh, yeah. historical accounts of the time. You know, I, I have to say in all gentleness that that's just based on misinformation. This is, this is garbage that's spread on the internet that just isn't true. In the introduction to Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? He says, I am not a Christian and I have no interest in promoting a Christian cause with a Christian agenda. I am an agnostic with atheist leanings. But as a historian, I think evidence matters, and the past matters. And for anyone to whom both evidence and the past matter, a dispassionate consideration of the case makes it quite plain, Jesus did exist. Those who care about evidence follow the facts rather than dismiss them. The evidence is right there before their eyes. So why don't you take it from here, Bart? I think that atheists have done themselves a, mis a, a disservice by jumping on the bandwagon of mythicism. Because, frankly, it makes it makes you look foolish to the outside world. It's, if that's what you're going to believe, you just look foolish. But Bart, is there any historical evidence for Jesus' existence? I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, I have a whole book on it. So there's a little bit of evidence. There is a lot of evidence. I mean, there there is so much evidence. Like how much evidence? It is. It is not. I mean. I know in the, in the crowds you all run around with, it's commonly thought that Jesus did not exist. Let me tell you, once you get outside of your conclave, there's nobody who, I mean, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. But surely there must be some scholars of antiquity who doubt Jesus' existence. There is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. But Bart, what are the reasons that scholars give for Jesus' existence? There, the reason for thinking Jesus exists is because he is abundantly attested in early sources. That's why. Um, a lot of stuff you mentioned uh, during your talk, or you mentioned some of the uh, 
the uh, Son of God stories that came before, like the Osiris story and everything. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with a movie called Zeitgeist. Oh, God. Okay, I know. I'm not, wait, 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 wait. I'm not in favor of this movie. In yeah. fact, I, I, I think that um, I, I would just get your take on the first part of that movie that's about that and which parts of it should not be paid attention to the whole so film, that I, so that I can kind of go to people and say the whole film and all all copies of it should be burned I okay I agree with that too so um, it's just hard because I, I have atheists actually come up to me all the time saying you really have to see this movie and it, it yeah. kind of yeah and that that's a problem that piss that movie pisses me off for that very reason because you have someone like it, you, it ends up in religious where he had a perfectly decent movie where he's making good arguments and he, there's you could have Bill Maher making this Jesus myth argument well, right? He could he could have given a correct one. Instead, he gave a complete bullshit asshole lame argument because he believes the Zeitgeist film, and that that's the kind of example of why people think myth theory is bogus is because that's what the myth theory they hear is that bullshit version of it. Um, and so that's that thing as a historian as a scholar it pisses me off because now I have to do double time to try and fix all the mess they've created by tainting everyone's brain with the wrong version of the theory that's easily refuted and easily ridiculed. And so that's what I I have to face. I walk in and try to talk about the Jesus myth theory, and they're all like attacking Zeitgeist as if I'm promoting that. Um, and it, that pisses me off because it, it makes my life a lot harder. It, it fucks with scholarship, and I just wish people would not do that. Horace was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth, he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. At the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. All right, now I'll ask a question. Horace, your mother's name was Isis, right? Mama. Yeah, that was Mama, all right. Named herself after her third cousin twice removed. Uh, right. And she was a virgin when you were born, right? Psst, hey, boy. Has anyone, I said, has anyone told these characters about the birds and the bees? Now look here, I said, look here. You the... Yeah, you. Come on over here, propeller head. I'm going to show you something over in the family room here that ain't fit for the eyes of a lady. Nice boy, but he don't hear a word you say. Now, you see this picture here? This here's a family portrait. At least I wanted to make him. It's showing my poor old dad Osiris laying there dead while my mama Isis is getting in a family way by way of him in the form of a hawk. Now, let me ask you something, boy. Does that, I say, does that look like it had result in a virgin birth? I guess not. Why's that sensor block there? Boy, ain't you paid attention? I said this was a family room. You were sharp as a bowling ball. Now, wait a minute. I know for a fact that your mother Isis was worshipped as a virgin. And when, I say, when exactly was that supposed to have been happening? Before or after I was born? structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in the tomb, and after three days was resurrected. The victim, a shepherd boy named Attis, was the son of King Croesus of Lydia. According to the witnesses, Attis was crucified on a tree during an event called Black Friday. Contrary to the report Dr. E had received, Attis had not been crucified. Instead, Addis had castrated himself because he was upset over the death of his girlfriend of many years, Sybil. What had happened is that this poor guy was about to marry his girlfriend, and before that could happen, some monster named Agadistus showed up at the wedding and caused mass hysteria. Unfortunately, his girlfriend died, and Addis got so upset that he committed suicide.
All right, so I, th I think that's that's good enough for the intro. So obviously, you know, I just selected the first two, uh, Horus and Addis from Zeitgeist, and I selected two claims, the virgin birth and also with Addis, the death by crucifixion and resurrection, and it's total lies. Yeah. It's not true. So, uh, yeah, that was my yeah. intro. So over to you guys. And once we get into the... Uh... David, so David's actually going to start playing clips and, and some of those clips. So whenever they were talking about Horus, uh, not the cartoon, but, but Horus and Addis, that was actually from the movie uh, Zeitgeist. And so David now is going to play uh, part of the movie, David, and then you're going to give some commentary on what Jordan Maxwell said uh, during, right. this, during this right. intro. Right. We're going to like just start showing you the movie now. I think this is a, a good time to actually – get into it i love that satire deal that was good <laughs> we That's need funny. some we need some laughs we need some laughs uh yeah but yeah yeah you know i agree with you dale uh there's a lot of people that believe this stuff and this is uh, and you, you saw it you saw it even when they address carrier and you know um go after uh the reality that Jesus actually existed. I mean, you see this, it's ridiculous, but the zeitgeist is worse than ridiculous almost. So, and I'm going to think about this too here. Well, think about this ahead, too. Ty. Bill Maher, Bill Maher believes this, you know, and, and just think about the people that he influences on a daily, you know what I'm saying? And so at some time, like, and, and I'm sure a lot of people had seen that clip that was in Dell's video I mean, this stuff is spreading like cancer. And I'm so glad that, you know, not only us, but there have been multiple people now on YouTube uh, debunk these claims. It, it's just ridiculous that people are still being influenced by this movie. Uh, yeah, it looks like David's gone. So, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you there, uh, Tyler. I, I think that a lot of the a lot of the claims are just outright lies. They're, they're yeah. fabulous. So I'm not mincing words. It's not, oh, they made an innocent mistake or they're exaggerating. They're just lies. And yep. people need to know that. So, yeah. And the problem is, is it's a web of lies. Sorry, I'm eating pizza here, guys, because this is just, you know, one of those occasions. But um, I'm not drinking milk out of a bag, but. <laughs> so but pizza out of a box. That, that's right. Um, yeah. And. I'm about ready to get started with it, uh, but I do want to say that, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's a bunch of web of lies that sound good, and there are associations that will tickle your ears, let's say. You know, there are associations that you can say, oh, that, that makes sense, but that's all they are. They're association fallacies without evidence, and that's the biggest problem you have here. Um, so even though it may sound cool and smart and, you know, um, you know, disproving Jesus and gets people all, you know, um, high and mighty on, on what they believe, but I don't know, it's ridiculous. And that's why we're here tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to start the movie. All right. Spirituality is a particular term which actually means a dealing with intuition. In the theistic tradition, the notion of clinging into a word, a certain act is regarded as uh, displeasing to a divine principles. A certain act is regarded as pleasing for the divine whatever. In the tradition of non-theism, however, it is very direct that the case history are not particularly important. What is actually important is here and now. Here and now. Now is definitely now. We try to experience what is available there on the spot. There's no point in thinking that the past did exist that we could have now. This is now. This very moment. This very moment. Nothing mystical, just now, very simple, straightforward. 
And from that narrowness, however, arises a sense of intelligence, always, that you are constantly interacting with the reality one by one, spot by spot, constantly. We actually experience fantastic precision, always. But we are threatened by the now, so we jump to the past or the future. Paying attention to the materials that exist in our life, all these choices take place all the time, but none of them are regarded as bad or good per se. Everything we experience are unconditional experience. They don't come along with the label by saying this is regarded as bad, this is good, but we experience them, but we don't actually pay heed to them properly. We don't actually regard that as a, that we are going somewhere, we regard that as a hassle, waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. That's the problem. And that is not trusting the nowness properly, that what is actually experienced now possessed a lot of powerful things. It is so powerful that we can't face it. Therefore, we have to borrow from the past, invite future all the time. <laughs> The more you begin to investigate what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see we've been lied to. We've been lied to by every institution. What makes you think for one minute that the religious institution is the only one that's never been touched? The religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education, who set up your international banking cartels. We have been misled away from the true and divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And unless and until you are prepared to look at the whole truth, and wherever it may go, whoever it may lead to, 
The more you educate yourself, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become, and you begin to see lies everywhere. You have to know the truth and seek the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right, folks, that's the first one. I wanted to start with Jordan Maxwell's uh, quote here. Tyler just dropped off. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to start with Jordan Maxwell's quote because he says some pretty interesting things, and it kind of sets the tempo if you uh, um, if you notice, right? Okay. It sets this tempo of, you know, he doesn't know what God is, but he knows that, the corruption, the religion's corrupt, and and you know our, our education is corrupt. So what the heck is he? Does he have the correct view now? Is is this what he's trying to say? Uh, and, and it's so funny that he actually uses scripture <laughs> to deny what to deny the scripture, right? To deny that Je- who Jesus is, right? So you know the truth shall make you free is straight out of the scriptures, right? So I mean, um. I think this is it's telling, right? I, he says he doesn't know what God is, but um, I know what he isn't, right? So how does he know that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest. I sk- I skip over that intro part. I always just go straight to the the parallel thing or whatever. But right, yeah. It's um, obviously he is trying to make a truth claim, so he is trying to imply that what his thesis here is in fact true. Um, He's trying to make a conspiracy theory and obviously we haven't got, got to it yet. uh, So I don't know, but basically his theory is look, Jesus is just a pagan myth and uh, Kate is copied from various pagan myths cobbled together. And he, the second part of his thesis related to Jesus is that this is all explainable through astronomy and certain astronomical objects explain the story of Jesus and stuff like that. So that's what we're getting to. So my whole thing is like, he's asserting a notion of God throughout the whole thing, right? You know, he's like saying, we got away from the divine that entails that he knows something about the divine, right? I mean, to even make this claim shows that he has to know a little bit about the, the, uh, you know, the divine, but he says he knows what God is isn't he doesn't know what god is but he knows what he isn't so i mean that he's just contradicting himself right there so i it just it blows my mind that people take this serious when all you have to do is think a little bit about what he's saying in this first uh section and it's really funny that uh, um jordan maxwell is an interesting character okay so i was introduced to his works uh not only through this movie, but a friend of mine at work again came up to me and, and was like, Hey, you got to listen to this. You got to listen to Jordan Maxwell. You got to do this. And I said, okay. So I did. And I was like, all right. So uh, I told my friend, Hey, let, let's, uh, let's get together and go over some of this stuff. So we did. And we had some very good conversations. However, I told my friend, I said, Hey, I'm going to reach out to him and, and challenge him to a debate. Right. So I did so, and I got a response, and that response was, read my books, pay the money, and maybe we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's- I said, "Why? Well, I, I know the content of, of what you're saying. Uh, why don't we have a debate about the contents of your book? And that's not what he wanted. So, it, you know, it just it, – that goes a long way that, you know, uh, uh, it, you know shows you something there. Yeah. Um, so – Jordan Maxwell is just like I said, he's an interesting character. He's all about the money. He's all about buy my books. You know, it has nothing to do with the truth. So I can boldly say that because that's how he dealt with me. So Tyler, you got anything, man? One thing. Oh. Um, okay. Oh god. Go ahead, Del. Go ahead. One well, one thing I guess, because I always just skip over the, this little intro part when I watched it. But one thing that's kind of interesting, he's saying, I don't know what God is, but I know what God isn't. Um, There are a lot of philosophers who will try to define God with negative properties, you know, like God, we know God is not this and stuff. It's popular in like mysticism. And the guy who's made this video, as well as his main source, RJS, are New Agers and into this kind of mystical stuff a bit. So, yeah, uh, David or Tyler, like, have you guys 
what are your guys thoughts on on that notion of god or that approach to knowing what god is what do you mean exactly bill like whenever you say it's mystical like where are we talking like an eastern orthodox sense or well, what do you mean um so i guess in the new ager sense because these guys are new agers but like it's in this sense that uh he makes this quote look we can't positively define god or understand or know god his attributes but we can know god based on what he's not you know he's not a human he's not finite so like if you define god you would define him negatively with the properties that he doesn't have or something that that doesn't make much sense to me just on the surface now granted i haven't done a lot of study into this but if you're defining god by his by negation right then it seems at the same time you would have to have some kind of positive affirmation about God being given God. What is, what is the definition of God, right? And in our sense, in, in the Christian theistic sense, it is a personal being that has basically created everything, right? And so just a rough intro to God there for those who don't know. Um, but, but at the same time, if you, if the Christian God is the true God, right, then you have to define him by positive. He is personal, for instance, uh, and just so many different things like that, you know, and that, that's why it doesn't make much sense to me. We can know God by claiming what he's not. Well, you know something by what it is in my, not what it's not. Right. Gotcha. Awesome. That's just my service. Right. I, I'm yeah, I, I agree with you, Tyler. And I, I think Dale does too. I think that, uh, we both hold, we all hold to the idea that good can exist without evil, but evil can't exist without good. Right. So evil is a corruption. Um, good. So, right. Yeah. Exactly. So you would have to know what the good is first to be able to kind of identify the evil. Right. So, um, that's kind of like that whole notion, that philosophical notion without getting too deep into it. But that, that's my answer to Dale. All right, cool. You know, and my, my question is just on the off the top. It's like, well, how do you know that God isn't what you're saying he's not? You know what I mean? Like, again, positive affirmation has to come in somewhere at that point. Because, again, how do you know what you know about your God, right? Yeah. I just think it's also so funny that Maxwell is like, educate yourself. Yet every yeah. form, every form that he would use to educate himself is corrupt to him. So how does he know what he's getting? Right. <laughs> so that's my spiel on Maxwell. We're going to get a, a quote here from uh, uh, Mr. Massey here. So hang tight. Let's go. Egyptologist Gerald Massey. The great <laughs> Egyptologist. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> See, this this cracks me up. I, it, all right, so you, you use Ger Jordan Maxwell fail, right? You use, use that moron. Okay, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be that. You can be negative. truthful, though. Oh, right? man. Yeah, but, you, you know, I, I, I'm not going to insult the guy, but I, he did he – did, try to make me buy his stuff before he would actually have a discussion with me. But uh, Massey was formally educated in English poetry and not Egyptology. And the, the reason the reason they use this quote from Massey is because Massey is kind of the root of these ideas, who was probably inspired by other, you know, uh, uh, skeptics at the time. But Massey was huge into Egyptology, but he never was a formal, he was never formally educated uh, in it. And archaeology has far surpassed him and don't even consider him as a valid source. So the fact that people still hang on to this guy who is a poet and not a Egyptologist, and they believe his claims about Egyptology, it goes a long way. It says a lot about where we are a, a, as a society, I think, as well, because I think we want to believe what we want to believe sometimes. We'll believe what's fashionable and what we want rather than what's the truth. 
And unfortunately, those type of ideas get halfway around the world before truth gets a chance to lace up its boots. So uh, anything you guys want to say on that? Uh, just so for the sake of the audience, because I'm seeing in the comments like people aren't uh, familiar with this movie and, and stuff like that or what's kind of going on. So just to kind of summarize. So at this point, what we're doing, Gerald Massey, um, he's one of the main sources, as David Russell was saying, right, um, as to where the this no these notions come from for the Zeitgeist movie. And he was around in the late 1800s. So the main point here is, number one, he was not an Egyptologist. Zeitgeist lied to you about that, about his credentials. Uh, secondly, he's 100 years out of date. There is no modern scholar with a PhD in Egyptology or history or anything who agrees with uh, what he's saying here. So I, I think in a nutshell, that's the only point I would contribute about this Gerald Massey part. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. You guys clear it up. So. All right, moving right along. Because I got to tell you the truth, folks. I got to tell you the truth. When it comes to bullshit, big time major league bullshit, you have to stand in awe of the all time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day and the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do and if you do any of these 10 things he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time All right, we got Carlin, right? Go oh, Carlin. you should have played. You should have played the rest of it. Okay, hold on. But he loves you. <laughs> he loves you. He loves you, and he needs money. He always needs money. He's all powerful, all perfect, all knowing, and all wise. Somehow, just can't handle money. Religion takes in billions of dollars, they pay no taxes, and they always need a little more. Now, you talk about a good bullshit story. Holy shit. All right, you can pause it. So, yeah, so, George Carlin. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, he's gonna, yeah, he's gonna say something, David. Like, oh, so. oh no, yeah. So yeah, we get we get another false assertion. This the, right here tells you where this is going, right? This is not an attack on religion. This is directly an attack on Christianity. And another reason I wanted to bring this up is for the simple fact is that, um. There's a lot that has to do with this anti-holiday crowd stuff that's in there. You know, a lot of these these comparisons that will come up are the same ones that Alexander Hyssop used and also many others, especially our uh, friends in the Torah observant community that want to say that we're pagans because we celebrate a pagan holiday and Christmas is a pagan holiday. So. Another reason why I wanted to address this is to actually show some of these historical sources uh, that actually don't say what these this video is claiming. Horace wasn't born on the 25th. 
You know, there's there's actually, you know, nowhere in history you're going to find that. So, I mean, there's just there's so much there. But Carlin's Carlin right away. He gets he, he comes out of the bat uh, misrepresenting Christianity. Hey, we don't believe God's in the sky. There's there's nowhere Christianity uh, talks about that. You know, you could say it's religion all you want, but. You're attacking specifically Christianity and we don't believe God is some guy in the sky that's watching everything you do every single day. He knows everything you're going to do. He knows it before you're going to do it. So, I mean, there's a lot of here, uh, a lot of things here that are being misrepresented right out the gate. So we see some logical fallacies already um, and baseless assertions, evidential, uh, uh, evident, evidential less <laughs> assertions. Dale? Uh, yeah. So on this, on this part again, uh, so I don't, I don't think obviously it's a misrepresentation of what Christians believe. So I, I guess this part is just kind of indicative uh, as a primer as to, you know, how this guy yeah. treats, uh, religious issues or religion in general. It's kind of just the standard like internet atheist or skeptic type type deal. Um, but yeah, it's it's it, this is just sort of a primer. It, it's not really a part of his main thesis or or what the video is is about. It's just kind of right. trying to prime people to be uh, religion stupid or something like that. Yeah. No, you're and right. You know, Dale. Go, ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, Tyler. Go ahead, bro. Oh, I was gonna let you go, man. I was just I was just wrapping it up. Oh, well, you guys said everything you want to say on George Carlin. That's cool. Go to the next thing. Yeah. Um. One other thing, though, is is I want to get us to the to the next part because I think we're going to get into the substance of of the video. And I, you know, even though I think this, like you said, it's a primer. It's it's pointing you to the direction they're they're going to go. It's not part of their main substance, but it, it you know you can pretty much tell what you're in for <laughs> mm -hmm. here. So, all right. This is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, history is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood the crops would not grow and life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or god, God's son, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Do you know that there are over All right, 
Dale, you got anything on this? This notion of this one? Sorry about the ads, guys. It's uh, my wife. No problem. Yeah, it's yeah. So 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 this is the first substantive claim that he's trying to make, and he's look. We've got the five sign. We've got the twelve signs of the zodiac. So it's definitely true. People, ancient people, looked up at the stars and had and had constellations and that sort of thing at a certain point in time. Uh, they all a lot of ancient peoples worshipped the sun. S U N. Uh, they showed, you know, for example, Akhenaten, who is um, a lot of skeptics will say he was the world's first monotheist in Egypt. He, he worshipped the Aten, the sun disk, uh, or the Egyptians, they had Ra, the, the sun god and stuff like that. So that part's true. But look what he's trying to set up here. You know, God's son, S-U-N. Well, that sounds like the Christian claim, the son of God, God's son, S-O-N. And he's making this simplistic equation as though the ancient people spoke English or something. God's son he is the same as the S-U-N son. Uh, so that's the major flaw so far, I guess, is he's trying to set it up that like the the son is the same as the, the son of God, S-O-N, because they sound the same in modern English, a language that didn't exist, um, <laughs> you know, until centuries after Jesus was alive and stuff like that. So yeah, so like one thing that I notice is is his assertion that ancient humans pretty much are scared of the dark, right? So like the sun gives us life, uh, saving power to mankind, and I'm just like, no, it was just as feared as the night was. You know, I mean, people made coverings so they didn't get burned. You know, I mean, the sun killed too. It wasn't uh, uh, the moon was also adored because you know evening brought rest and fellowship you know so that, that's one of the biggest things i observed too tyler well i was just gonna say you know piggyback on, on what dale said about god's son and, and son of god all these different things in english what's interesting is the new testament was written in point of greek and this would make absolutely no sense to a new testament writer or even person in uh, a, a Hellenized Jew or even the Romans at that time. The Greek word for sun is Helios. The Greek sun or the Greek word for sun, S O N, is Puyos. They sound nothing similar. And so I, I just, you know, applaud Dell for making that connection that look, you're talking about a language that came around how long ago, guys? 1600s was the mo more formal, what we're related to now in modern English. Yeah, um, well, yeah, maybe even a little before that, but I but I like that point though. Awesome, cool. Right on. Let's continue. Eighty-eight and other behavioral challenges. Likewise, the twelve constellations represented places of travel for God's son, and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set, and Set was the personification of the darkness or night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. All right, pause it. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th. All right, so I just, wanna, I just wanna address this first claim in sight, guys. So one, of, as we just heard, one of the first claims made about Horus in Zeitgeist was that he is in constant battle with his uncle and brother, Set, and would dominate when the sun would come up and would be defeated by Set when the sun went down. Problem is, I have not found any sources to affirm this. What I have found is that Horus and Set were indeed portrayed to battle, given the fact that Set killed his brother and Horus' father, Osiris, 
but the rivalry was because Horus was dedicated to avenging his father's death as well as to fight for the throne of Osiris and become the ruler of Egypt. Sources also claim not that Set was a personification of the night and Horus a personification of the day, but rather Set was lord of the red land or the desert and Horus was lord of the black land, the flood plain around the Nile River. These colors reflect the fact that the desert sands have a reddish hue and the land around the Nile turned black when the annual flood waters receded. And so there's, this is just an absolute straight up lie that makes the story sound good from the zeitgeist point of view, but has absolutely no basis in reality whatsoever. Dale? Uh, nothing really to add to what Tyler said, I guess, other than the, yeah, obviously he's equating it with this forces of light, you know, Horus as God's son on the forces of light. And then Set is kind of like the Satan, the forces of darkness stand in. So that's the, that's the thing that he's trying to establish. But as Tyler said, that's totally not true. That's not what Egyptian mythology is talking about here. Right. So we get this uh, first claim born on December 25th. Right. I'm going to play it until all the I guess most of the claims are up, but we'll hit each one of them. All right. Of the Virgin Isis Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east. And upon his birth, he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. At the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. All right, so we get this uh, born on December 25th, right? There's no evidence of a birth on the 25th. In traditional festivals, uh, the Multicultural Encyclopedia places horses birth sometime in November, right? Yeah. So we're already starting off wrong. Um, Plutarch, actually, if we want to go back to history, Plutarch places it near the Solstice, but never uh, an exact date on that. So... I don't think the Bible ever mentions a date for Jesus' birth anyway, so I don't know why this comparison is even being made. Tyler? Uh, I had to drop out there for a second, um, but I don't really have anything on the date, but I don't know if you guys talked about being born as a virgin yet. That's what I have stuff on. Okay. Yeah, so December 25th, David covered all the points that I wanted to say. Yeah, so according to Egypt, yeah. we've got different versions. Again, uh, some of them post-date Jesus. Uh, never is it December 25th that he's born on. Uh, secondly, even if Horus was born on December 25th, for the sake of argument, um, that's not a parallel to Jesus because the Bible, nowhere does the Bible say that Jesus was born on December 25th. And in fact, the hints are he was born sometime in autumn or spring, right? Because shepherds are out. They wouldn't have been out uh, in the fields on December 25th, it would have been too cold, uh, as some biblical scholars have argued. So the point is here, not only is it not true, but even if it was true, it's a moot point because the Bible doesn't say Jesus was born on December 25th. So you can't establish a, a parallel. You know, that didn't come in until centuries later. Right. So he was also born of a virgin, Tyler. Yeah, so... I, Isis Mary, I like how he kind of throws that in there very subtly. Isis Mary, but every single source I've read makes clients contrary to that guy. So first of all, the name Mary, uh, M-E-R-I, is never found in regards to Isis' name. But to get to the birth narrative, in one version, after Osiris is murdered and dismembered by Set, Isis sets out to retrieve all of Osiris' body parts. The problem is, she can't find his penis since it was eaten by a catfish or a crab in some version. But like you said, David, uh, bringing up Plutarch, according to Plutarch's account, Isis uses her magic powers to resurrect Osiris and fashions a phallus in order to conceive her son. 
However, older versions of the story actually have the penis of Osiris surviving, but either way, the conception of Horus involves sexual intercourse, just like Dell's uh, awesome cartoon uh, pointed out. Right on. Dale? Yeah, once again, Tyler kind of nailed it. So again, he wasn't born of a virgin. Um, everywhere we have um, stories about the conception of Horus, it's through sexual intercourse. As my as Tecton TV's cartoon there had it, that's kind of the most common thing. I myself was in Egypt. I had a tour guide who was an Egyptologist. Um, I saw that slab with my own eyes kind of thing of the story of Horus. Um, there are also uh, stories about Horus's conception uh, sorry, not Horus's conception, but in, in the womb before Osiris and Isis. So Osiris is Horus's daddy. Isis is Horus's mom. Um, even before they were born, uh, there are some Egypt uh, myths where they have sex in the womb before they're born kind of thing. So yeah, the, Isis was not a virgin at the time she conceived. Horus, there are no no myths at all. Uh, nowhere is she called Isis Mary. That's just totally made up. Um, yeah, I think that's it in terms of the virgin birth thing. So, yeah. So what about, uh, the three Kings? He, he had three Kings visit him on his birth. No sources that I've researched mention anything. Not, well, let, let's talk about a couple things here. So nothing that I've read mentions anything about a star in the East or being adored by three Kings. In fact, most of the gods of Egypt sided with Horus in his battles with Set. And so where this talks about three kings, I, I really don't know. But nothing about him being a teacher at the age of 12 and really nothing about a bad person. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just so. say. Uh, so once again, Tyler's totally right. There, there's no three kings at all in the literature. And David, maybe back up. Just so people can see those those claims, if you can, or I can't right now. Okay. It's giving me problems. <laughs> That's why okay. it took me a while to get back there. Okay, so so no problem. So yeah, there are no three kings. Secondly, this is another case of well, let's pretend there Horace did have three kings attend his birth. Who cares? The Bible doesn't claim that Jesus had three kings. They're wise men, right. and it doesn't <laughs> assign a number. So it's again right. an F thing. It fails. Yeah, and that was another big problem I had with it is like, okay, well, the Bible never talks about three kings either. So what do we do with that? <laughs> but uh, what was the other one? He was crucified. Oh, okay. Right? What What else do Dale, we got? You have this one. You want to go to crucified next? Okay, so yeah. So what did you have? Um, well, I think you performed miracles i had something to okay say. go ahead Hit um it. so yeah so in egyptology no horace never committed any miracles at all during his ministry uh he was never a teacher that was another one of the points um mm -hmm. uh, nor was he a teacher at the age of 12 that's nonsense there is in in some of the myths uh there are stories about horace uh as a child and stuff like that, performing some miracles as a child, not as a teacher, but it's through the magic of Isis, his mother, and stuff like that. But again, it's it's not attached to some kind of adult teaching ministry like it is with Jesus. So that's just totally, that's kind of like a, I don't know, a quarter truth or something like that. But again, as an adult, Horace never uh, did miracles or had a ministry or something like that. Right on. Tyler? I just, I don't have anything about miracles, but as far as the 12 disciples of Horus go, or um, the Shimsu Hiru. So I was actually doing uh, some research on this last night, and man, I, for some reason, his name is escaping me, David. I think you interviewed him, uh, the guy who did uh, Cold, Cold Case Christianity. Uh, Jay Warner Wallace. Jay Warner Wallace. Actually, uh, so on his website, there he talks about... Uh, Instead of 12 disciples or the Shimsu Hiru, uh, he talks about four. Now, I maybe I disagree with him on this, but let me just quote uh, Dr. And Andrea Sinclair, who holds a master's in the late Bronze Age Eastern Mediterranean Near Eastern Archaeology and a doctorate right. in Egyptology, uh, specializing in icon iconography and cultural interconnection. She says, quote, magical pasts are attractive to humans and the Egyptians of 1200 BCE, 300 BCE, 
were as receptive to myth, fantasy, and tales of idyllic past as the millions who subscribe to pseudo history websites and hungrily buy their embellishments of meager evidence. But the Egyptians had a better excuse. This was their belief system, how they thought the universe worked. We don't have this excuse. Although I must confess, the Shimsu Hiru are a perfect opportunity for ringing those pseudo cash registers, as there is very little actual evidence of them if you ignore the out of date text that fraudsters rely on to vamp up their stories. All we really know, now here's the important part all we really know is that the Egy ancient Egypts, like nearly any other culture, believed their mythical early kings were gods or divine spirits of the royal dead and beyond that little else so you can basically make anything up under those circumstances like the followers of Horus were initiates of an elite ac academy of astrologists at Heliopolis as Graham Hancock and Robert Bavels claim uh, they can be reptilian Illuminati aliens as Chris Thompson states Alchemist of an advanced civilization from 10,000 BCE is Andrew Collins and William Henry State. Keepers of alien sacred knowledge is Andrew Collins again. And ancient pages report and the list goes on. And due to lack of any images to put with these stories, you can instead pad them out with fan fiction artwork that looks like it was stolen straight out of a computer game or more likely Pinterest. He goes on to say this, the last thing. Seriously, guys. Stop believing books written in 1900 are accurate. And to those pseudos who are still citing obsolete translations from 1905 and esoteric nonsense from 1923, upgrade your sources, you lazy and cheap expletive. Might I also add zeitgeist to that list, Dr. Sinclair? One, <laughs> one thing I want to want to add about the 12, you reminded me, Tyler. So you are right about the four followers, but he... Uh -huh. Um, there's a, they were a specific type. He also had 16 followers as well of a different type. Okay. So yeah, they're metal workers. For oh, yeah, there's an Egypt name. I don't know what it is offhand, but there. So there, that's a total of 20 followers, four of one type, 16 of another. The way Zeitgeist does, or they're well, 16 minus four equals 12. That's how these guys get the 12. This is the twisted logic. So. You want to hear something funny to that, Dale? So in this article that I just quoted, and I'll post a link for anybody to go read the description, she says in the earliest sources, those blacksmiths or, or metal workers or even the followers, the Shimsu Hiru, they don't exist in the in the earlier sources. This came later uh, as as a, uh, I guess, a later uh, invention. So, yeah, but I'll, I'll link you to the article. Yeah, Tyler, also to back up that point, though, it, it, it's so funny you mentioned that because uh, they predicate that. They go with it because what type of figure doesn't have a following of some sort? Yeah. yeah. You know? We got uh, followers. But, I mean, but, man. But, 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 you know, but here's the problem is, is that, you know, they're relating this to Christianity, right? So it's abundantly clear, right? This is – they're attacking Christ. Right, they're not attacking any other religion. They're not doing anything like that. They're going straight after the Christian religion, right? Sure. Does it? Does all this twelve, uh, the number twelve? Why are you comparing it to a zodiac when Israel's history would be what, uh, you know, they would have used versus a zodiac sign? And even if, even if the Israel, if Israel used these zodiac signs, whatever. The notion is, is that uh, the twelve disciples reflect the twelve tribes of Judah. You know Israel's history, not uh, necessarily uh, linking with Osiris or even the zodiac. One one thing I'll just so you're getting ahead, like that's coming up in the video. Oh, is it? Uh, oh. Yeah, they they compare the twelve tribes and stuff like that. That it's all the twelve signs of the zodiac, but. Number one, we know for a scientific, historically proven fact, um, the Zodiac, the 12 constellations of the Zodiac didn't exist until in Babylon, Babylon in 500 BC. The 12 tribes of Israel predate that by centuries. Nobody doubts that. Even biblical minimalist atheists and skeptics will admit that the 12 tribes predate the, the 12 signs of the Zodiac. But again, that, yeah, that's coming up later in the, the videos, one of their claims and stuff. So. 
I was going to say the number 12 revolves around Israel's history. You got two numbers that really stand out. That's 12 and 7, right? But notice in the entire Zeitgeist film, you don't see anything mentioned about the number 7, but yet it's this 12 that keeps popping up. And you're right, Dale. He relates it straight to the zodiac sign, and which you just perfectly said that didn't exist until centuries after Israel's religion was already established. Bingo. What about Horace being born in a cave? Born in a cave? Horace was born in the swamps. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, that I'm was, uh, um, who is it? Uh, James Frazier is the one that tells us that uh, H- Horace was built in the swamp or born in a swamp. I think so. I don't have the quote right off. No, I think there's a lot of these guys actually born in a swamp. Well, and here's <laughs> the thing, too. You got to think whenever it comes to Egyptology and e- Egyptian myths, there are multiple handfuls of versions of the story, right? Which makes right. the Bible even that much more special. We have manuscripts, and David and I have talked about this on the show multiple times. We have five, over 5,800 and probably getting close to 6,000 now Greek manuscripts that all tell the same story. They all tell the same narrative. It yeah. doesn't change over time and multiple versions keep getting at it. But. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have a didactic. I mean, they didn't have a set theology. And right. they all people could do is piece together and speculate, really, you know? So it just – it blows my mind. It blows my mind. Um, they I were would, some uh, good storytellers, so I'll tell that. Yeah, and they changed. I mean, they didn't have a controlled world tradition, you know? Right. Um, but uh, I do want to talk about the crucifixion. Right. I, I have uh David, I have something to share if you on the crucifixion part if you want to see that for sure. And it's it's only like a couple minutes, but it's the same. Uh you want me to take this off? Oh yeah, I guess only one person can share at a time. Yeah. <coughs> That's shown up. Yep, there you go. Okay, so this is about the crucifixion thing. It's muted, Dale. I was going to say, I can't hear anything. Yeah, I can't hear it, Dale. You can't hear it? No, it's no. it's muted on our end. Um, okay, so maybe so stop sharing and then... Sh- uh, why could you guys hear the... Okay, so present, share screen. Um, is there a share sound tab? No, uh, it should should uh, uh, go automatic. Share system audio. Here it is. There you go. Okay. You guys can hear it? You can hear it? Mm, yeah. You. Yep. Got it. Oh, yeah? Well, I got you on at least one parallel, Horace. I see it right here in this picture of you. Uh, yeah. What about that? Oh, it's nothing. She's just going to say... Don't try to get out of this holding. You can clearly see in this picture that Horace was crucified. Crucified? What? I say, what the heck does crucified mean? Oh, it's a form of punishment for criminals that won't be invented for another few hundred years. One where basically you're nailed to some wood or something and hoisted upright, so that you suffer a slow, agonizing death. And that's what you think's happening to me in that picture? Well... Sorry, little lady. What I'm doing in that picture is stretching my arms out like a hawk. Doing my morning stretch, don't you know? It keeps the limb limber. <laughs> you just get through that bonnet of yours. I know that. What I'm saying later Christians adapted the motif for their own purposes. Oh, yes, of course. That's your handy-dandy excuse any time one of your parallels is debunked. So there you go. That that's uh yeah. <laughs> kind of so yeah, that would that's a Deborah that's a that's a Deborah Murdoch thing. She's the one that draws parallels between uh being cruciformed and actually being crucified. That the cruciform where the gods hold out their arms and stuff, uh is is where Christians got the idea of 
uh, crucifixion, that Jesus probably never was crucified, which I don't see how she could even come up with that. <laughs> I mean, crucifixion is probably one of the best attested things in uh, in history, you know, as far as dealing with Christ, you know. So, yeah, Tyler? Nah, I mean, I ain't got nothing else to add. I, you know, I, so maybe for our listeners, but I had originally thought that crucifixion was invented by the Romans, but I was found to be wrong about that. So it actually comes from Syria. Uh, some, some scholars think of Syria, but then later on it was introduced to the Greek culture and then Hellenized, you know, in the, in the Hellenization era. Uh, that's where the Romans actually picked it up. So I thought I had heard somewhere before that Rome had been crucifixion, but I guess that's not true. So right on, right on. Um, I think we can move on, guys, to Addis. So let's do Addis, the by vegetation kings. god. At the age of twelve, he was a prodigal child teacher. And at the age of thirty, nope. he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus Pause. had twelve disciples. He traveled about with performing miracles. Such as healing the sick and walk. Okay, so real quick, yeah, just a quick, just just quick. So there is a figure, my knowledge of Bell. Maybe you can add a little bit more input. It's that Anna the Baptizer. I, I I think skeptics point to this this person and say, "Well, see, here here's Anna the Baptizer." But the problem is that in the accounts of Horus and all the different versions that there are. There is no link between Horus and Anna ever even meeting. So to say that he was baptized, it, it, again, another false claim that's just kind of stacking up now in the uh, in the lies being reported. But Dell, I didn't know if you had any info on that or any more info on that. Yeah, he uh, so he was associated he was associated with embalming and funerals, right? He was a jackal headed. Um, God and stuff like that. So he was not, um, he had nothing to do with baptizing people and stuff. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's this book called the gods of Egypt, right? Uh, written by, uh, Alan Gardner. Good movie, um, by the way. Um, yeah, Alan Gardner. And he thinks that this, this claim is speculative on, uh, and has to actually do with Anubis. Uh, and his ritual cleaning, which actually doesn't taste, take place in this reality. So he thinks that's kind of where that came from, that, that speculation came from. I was going to say, there but, is a lot of similarities between Anna and Anubis. That's yes, exactly. Side, so. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, good book, Gods of Egypt. Uh, but anyways, good yeah, let's, let's, let's go. That is it is. Horus was known by many gestural names, such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. Not so much. After being betrayed no by source. Typhon, Horus was crucified, Heresy. married for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate in many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general what? mythological structure. Addis right. of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days, was resurrected. Pause it! All right. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, Addis was worshipped in Phrygia, Asia Minor, and later throughout the Roman Empire, where he was made a solar deity in, guess what, guys? Second century A.D. Addis, however, was not born of a virgin, as that guy claims, but rather he is the offspring of his mother, Nana or Nana, and the hermaphroditic demon Agdistus or Sybil, as uh, Dale's cartoon uh, claimed a while ago. The story goes that the gods tricked Agdistus into swallowing a sleeping potion, and after succumbing to the effects of the potion, since Agdistus or Sybil, as I will call this demon both names during this, uh, had both male and female genitalia. So the gods tied his male genitalia to his foot. He castrates himself when he woke, when he awakes and stands up, and his genitalia actually falls to the earth, fertilizing the ground. An almond tree grew where it fell, and Nana, the daughter of the river god, river god Sangarius, picks 
almonds from the tree and eats them. Nana then becomes pregnant with Addis. Zeitgeist also claims that Addis was crucified. The fact of the matter was that according to the cult of Sibel, so the followers of Agdistus or Sibel, Sibel, uh, Sibel actually kills Addis and not by crucifixion. During Addis's wedding, as Bill's video explained earlier, because of the jealousy that fueled Sibyl, he drove, he, she, drove the bride, the daughter of King Midas in some stories, uh, Addis and King Midas mad. Addis and King Midas then castrates himself in front of the wedding guests, and because of the self-inflicted injury, Addis dies. However, the Romans say that Addis died by being gored by a board that was sent by Zeus. That guy also claims that Addis was resurrected, but this is simply untrue. Sybil had asked Zeus after the fact to bring Addis back to life, but Zeus only had the ability to preserve Addis's body to make sure it did not decompose or decay. Another version of the story states that Addis was turned into a tree. Also, in my research, I have not found, or I have not found, in any account a death period of three days. There was a five-day festival in honor of Addis, in which on the fourth day was when the rebirth was celebrated, but it does not specify how long Addis was dead until he was reborn. But it would make sense that in the story of Addis that a rebirth element was introduced, given the fact that Addis was a vegetation god. The connection between his death and rebirth was thought to symbolize the cycle by which vegetation is reduced in the summer and fall months and returns to the spring. Very good. Dale? Yeah, so Tyler kind of gave uh, all, all my tips and secrets and stuff there. So, yeah, he Sorry. Kinda, no, that's good. You, you were very thorough in covering the history. Um, I guess one thing... It shows I, that we're consistent, though, right? For sure, yeah. We're finding this <laughs> about the yeah. almond tree. I thought I was going to be special in revealing that, but no. Um, but Sorry. Did you did you talk about... So, so obviously, the way he dies, the, the part of the video that I... Uh, mentioned was about, oh, he was crucified, it died, and three days later he rose from the dead. That's complete bunk. Um, so he did die, but he died through castration after his girlfriend was um, killed at the wedding. He cut off his manhood and you know died that way. There is no mention of a resurrection at all. Uh, in one of the versions, at best, all you get is that well, his hair continued to grow and his pinky finger would flick. That was it. He was still dead as a doornail. Um, so, yeah, he, he did not rise from the dead. That's just a lie kind of thing or an exaggeration at best. Right. And also you got to realize the cult of Addis actually evolved in response to Christianity. So there's that. That's right. It, it didn't even come. This, the story there didn't even come about until 150 A.D., or after that, sorry, after 150 AD. So the pagans are copying the Christians, I would say, if, if you want to. Yeah. And there's a lot of that that goes on that's just not uh, stressed enough. And that's where a lot of this ho anti-holiday crowd uh, uh, comes in. Because God forbid that Christians have their own traditions that other people copied from. Yeah. You know what's yeah. interesting is that they actually address that side, guys. And Basically, they make Justin Martyr out to look like a fool because what, what was his main reason for saying that the pagans would steal from Christianity if the devil made him do it, right? Whenever Justin was actually, and David, I'm sure you have more on this than I do, but whenever Justin was actually trying to show the consistencies between the two or multiple religions that the Romans held to, right? He was evangelizing and saying that, look, guys, what we're saying is not some out of the blue, just just ridiculous stuff. Part of these things are actually in your stories themselves. It was an evangelizing technique. It was. It was, and they never and they they never fully quote uh, the quote, you know, because because he 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 goes on to say, but very different, right? right. Uh, so I mean, they. It's it's wrong on so many levels and it's cherry picking on so many levels. Honestly, guys, this is all I got. Uh, I could keep going through Krishna if you guys want to, but I mean, this follows a similar thread. I just have a question for Dale. So, when in the in the video, we haven't got to it yet. Maybe we'll get to it next time. But he talks about Orion's belt 
and, and it was called the Three King. My question, Dale, is do you know if that's factual? I mean, I'm sure because everything this dude is spitting out is in some way, shape, or form painted. Uh, but have you ever done any research on that? Or, David, do you guys know if Orion's belt was ever called the Three Kings? Um, As a matter of fact, it is. It's still called the Three really? Kings in places like Puerto Rico and other places like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The thing I was going to add about that, because, uh, yeah, if if, if uh, David gets to that part in the video, you'll see. So it's the, the way they say it is the sun around December 25th is here. And then there's the star in the east, right? And then those those three stars on Orion's belt that they're called the three kings, and they're following the star of the east, uh, going towards the sun. So, well, that's the virgin birth story going to going to Bethlehem. The three kings go to Bethlehem and stuff like that. But if you actually look at the astronomically, right on December twenty fifth, it's it's a little bit off. Again, we're we're not. You'll see it in the video. It's it's not properly aligned with the sun. A better date would have been in November. Uh, in late November, they, the stars would have been better aligned if you wanted to make up that story and say that's where that's coming from. Um, and there's there's also a problem with that star of the east. Uh, from what I remember, it was never called that. Um, I think it's Sybaris or something like that. The star is named Sybaris. So uh, that part's made up as well. But yeah. I know, Dale, that before we before we bounce out, it sounds like uh, we're getting close to winding down. But Dell, you had made a, and I want to give you the glory of it. So, um, <laughs> you had made a comment about how there's kind of two parts to the first part of the Zeitgeist movie, how they're trying to debunk Christianity. And you had said in the second part that they try to connect the story of Christianity with astrology. Is there anything that you would want to say about that? And I know we didn't get to it per se in the video, but that's like the next section. And so I was wondering if you had anything prepared that you wanted to share with us and with our audience uh, concerning why Christianity is in no way, shape, or form linked to astrology and the ways that guys lays it out. Uh, so astronomy, right? Not not astrology. If I say oh, that. I'm sorry. My no, apologies. For, um, so yeah, so the, basically the Zeitgeist movie, and we'll get to it, I guess, uh, in the coming weeks when we get to that part of the video. But so the, the first part is what kind of what you've seen, right? They take all these pagan gods and they say, oh, look at all these parallels with Jesus. Um, obvi obvious, the obvious implication is Christianity got these ideas from the pagan myths or were influenced by them to some extent. But the second aspect is kind of like an overall explanatory hypothesis and saying, look, all of these pagan myths are actually explained uh, explainable by the fact, not that they just copied each other, but they're getting it from the stars themselves, the movements of the sun and certain positions of stars and stuff like that are constellations. And it's all connected to the Zodiac um, and stuff like that. So that's the second part of his hypothesis is that, well, where did the ancients get all of these ideas for virgin birth and stuff like that? Uh, basically from the sun and the stars, watching the night the night sky and watching the movement of the sun over the course of the year. Um, and yeah, we're going to find out that's based on a bunch of nonsense and again, outright lies. Uh, they're just wrong on the science for a lot of it as well. Right on. Right on. David, take us home. You're muted. Also, hard guys, to take time well when you're done. muted. <laughs> I am home. No, I'm, uh, I'm home. We all uh, are home. The, uh, I, guys, it's been great. Uh, this has been fun. Um, like I said, you know, this is to just get some information I, I, out there, you know, just to so people can rest assured that, you know, Christianity isn't borrowing from pagan religions i mean it's just it's an anathema to a monotheist to borrow from polytheism you know and just try to do that you know i mean it's just uh, I, at least for me and whatever i've uh studied you know and studying i find that christians actually have their own traditions that they've made throughout the years and you know certain sections of them uh certain sects have their own traditions versus other ones have their own traditions but they're all christian they're not just 
grabbing from pagans and trying to incorporate stuff like you've been told by people like Alexander Hislop and and other I, I don't even want to call them historians, you know, um, bad historians. Fraudsters. Let's you know, use the or word. Poets. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Get your, get your history from poets, please. Please don't get your history from poets. Uh, but yeah, so like, it, I like a, lot goes into it. a lot of it goes, uh, goes into it. But next time, guys, we're going to continue the talk. We're just going to, like I said, we're winding down the year. We're just trying to have fun instead of just taking off. Uh, for the holidays, we we want to be able to give you guys a little something to chew on. So, um, Tyler, why don't you uh, tell everybody to stay safe and all that? Stay safe and all that. No, we got some good stuff coming up in 2023. So I've already released it, and it's something that I think people have been wanting to see now for a little bit. And so we have actually got Dr. Tim Stratton. And Dr. Michael Preciado. I cannot say it in the right way. Please forgive me. Hopefully, we'll have Eli Ayala on soon uh, to be able to pronounce it in the in the correct way. I can't roll my arms, guys, and so I would just do disservice if I would try to pronounce uh, Dr. Preciado's last name in the correct uh, dialect. And so, uh, but we do have those two guys together, and and so we're not going to say that it's going to be anytime soon, but we are shooting to get them together for a formal debate uh, during 2023. So I, I want to say we're thinking maybe June, July-ish, because this is we're going all out with this one, y'all, and we want to bring you the best of the best, and we want to bring the best debate on this subject to all the social media platforms. And so we have got that in the works. We're going to take our time with it and hopefully present a a debate that will be a resource for, for many years to come. We also have our gospel documentary that we will be starting soon, hopefully. Um, if, if people don't stop scheduling with us, no, we love people to schedule shows like this, uh, but we do plan on starting our gospel documentary uh, very, very soon. We can still donate to that cause. We still have um, all of our donations kept locked up and tight and uh, we're saving that for advertising money to be able, once we get this document done, to be able to promote it and share it with as many people as the Holy Spirit uh, will allow. So if you would like to donate to that cause, please hit myself up, hit up David. Uh, we can give you links. Uh, I'll actually post a link whenever I get internet back. Uh, we'll post a link in the description uh, to where you, if you would like to make a financial contribution to our cause uh, for our gospel documentary in a, in a time where things like zeitgeist and, and just Christianity is being attacked on all fronts. We need the gospel to go to as many people as we can. And we love working with people that have that same mindset that like Dale, like everybody that's been uh, on the show for the most part that has that same mindset of wanting to get the gospel out. Everything that we agree on as a, as the whole unit that is in Christ, Christ's body. You know, that's what defines us, I think, as Christians, as belief, trust in the good news that Jesus Christ is King, that he died for our sins, and that he is uh, in heaven right now at the, at the right hand of the Father, interceding for everyone who will come to him through faith. And, you know, I, I just... He lifted me up out of the darkness, man. And for that, like, I'm forever indebted. And so uh, I do my testimony on another uh, show, so you can find that and uh, get all the details of exactly how that happened. But, y'all, it's been fun. Dell, it's been a pleasure. Is there anything that you would like to tell our listeners before we all head off? And then I'll close this out. Uh, yeah. So, so again, I, I was kind of scanning over the comments and I see Ringo, um, he's saying he's never heard of this movie and, you know, yeah. a couple other people were interested, but they were saying they didn't understand it. The, the faithiest, faithiest atheist, for example. So Richard, uh, Richard. Yeah. I don't know if he's still around, but, um, what I'll yeah. do is uh, I will, when I post up my version of this episode, I will post up a bunch of sources, 
uh, yep. who go over the Zeitgeist movie in great detail, as well as the Zeitgeist movie itself, if you haven't seen it. So um, there will be sources on, on realseekerministries.wordpress.com. So you can take it further than what we've done here, if you want. Please do. Please do. And uh, I'll grab those sources as well, though, whenever you post them and post them in our description so people have them uh, uh, on both platforms. The more, the better, right? Absolutely. And so, uh, so with that, guys, David, it's been fun. Dell, it's been a pleasure having you on, brother. And we will see you next time on Faith Unaltered. But until then, good night, God bless, and stay like Christ.